Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. How telling fart jokes to tweens on MySpace helped us start a charity and make a documentary in East Africa. So without further ado, Jay Grandin and Leah Nelson. Thank you. So yeah, Miha, that was awesome and it's a really great segue into what we're going to talk about because we can totally relate to that feeling of really, really knowing shit, no shit about shit, you know, like yeah. we, we can relate to that. A um, couple things before we begin. We're not geeks, but we really, really are trying hard to be. Um, <laughs> so hopefully that'll happen for us. And you guys kind of scare us, but not in a kind of because you're scary, just because um, you've been doing this for so long, and like Chris said uh, yesterday, um, all of this exists because of what you've done. So. And we barely beat our moms to MySpace, so yeah. or to Facebook rather. Um, and because you guys kind of scare us, Leah tells me that I talk too fast when I'm scared. So we decided that we should let you guys give me real time updates if I'm talking too fast, or if you want to say <laughs> anything else. So. So send you a text if he's if he's rambling on. Don't, don't bother putting it on Twitter because Jay doesn't know how to look at Twitter on his phone. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so um, we run a small company in Vancouver called Giant Ant Media. And what Giant Ant does is it makes social... I need... Oh, okay. It's okay. We'll Take it off. Okay, technology again. Oh. Really already? I've got to take this. <laughs> test. It's on. Test, test. Okay, we're really new to presenting too, so if we completely derail, we're just going to uh, blame it on Drew's cancer. <laughs> too much awesome. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, so what Giantette does is we make social objects uh, for people, which are things that you can um, discover and uh, watch and enjoy online, and more often than not for us, uh, those are videos. So um, we're storytellers, that's what we do, so we're just going to tell you this story of um, how we started telling fart jokes and how that turned into a project where we went to Tanzania and helped a group of street hustlers record a hip-hop album. So um, like most good stories, we're just going to start right in the middle, and I'm going to read a little excerpt from a blog post um, from the middle of that project when we were in Tanzania. This is Tuesday, November 4th. 2008. Every day for the past five, we've been boarding the Dala Dala and making the trek, crammed shoulder to shoulder, armpit to nose, crotch to ass, afro to ear, to the Uswalini, the ghetto. Am I talking too fast now? <laughs> to record this hip hop album. Each day when we walk down the dirt streets, swarms of little kids run alongside us, rolling tires, shouting, Mzungu, Mzungu, which basically means whitey. Dodo describes the Uswalini as houses built without a map, which is brilliant. That's just it. We've powered through four tracks on the album thus far that so astoundingly exceed our expectations that we see Tanzanian shilling signs flashing in the eyes of these street boys. They record all day, go home to the streets all night and to practice and write, and get up and do it all over again each morning in a hot, foam-clad room that smells like a thousand armpits. The other day it was 34 degrees outside, but at least five degrees hotter in the studio, then at least another five degrees hotter in the recording booth. After 10 minutes of filming in there, my shirt is soaked right through, and the guys point and laugh. Three days ago we were complaining over breakfast that things have gone so well that it's going to be hard to find enough conflict for the film. Cut to Ninja stealing the salaries of the other guys, fighting about which tracks to record, and shouting matches over botch verses. We spoke too soon, drama now equals high, a film is emerging. Uh oh. Uh oh. We don't have sound here. Do we have sound? Hmm. Drew? <laughs> we need a geek. <laughs> Bring us a geek. Drew. <laughs> well. Okay, well. It's going to be a lot more Yeah, just play them and talk over it. So this is, okay. this is just a little clip. We're going to just try to situate you uh, to Tanzania. This is one of, uh, one of the street youth that we were uh, working with. And I'll just, I'll just carry on and let that 
let that play. Um, so this right now was about one year after we sat down in Vancouver with our friend Dania Fast for a glass of wine to um, discuss her MA research that she'd been doing in Tanzania with this group of street kids. Um, the conversation basically went, uh, Dania told us that she knew these amazing musicians. She said to us, do you think we could record an album? We said, yes, maybe we should make a film. What do you think about that? She said, why not? Um, maybe we should form a charity. And we said, that sounds reasonable. So <laughs> that was about the extent of the conversation. And after that moment, we um, started along the, uh, the path to trying to make all this happen. So I guess the backstory is kind of interesting. And that's, what were our qualifications to do this? And how did we get there? And our qualifications were that we had a viral video. And uh, maybe you guys have seen this. So we made this. And what happened was I was working in Michigan as um, uh, designing office furniture of all things. And I was back home for Christmas 2006 for a conjugal visit with Leah. And we had a few drinks. And we made a video. And, um, Does and anyone if, recognize this? Has anyone seen this? Anyone yeah. So um, we had this video. And we, we put it on MySpace, because that's where you put videos. And we didn't think it was very funny, so we kind of waited for a while to do this. And then once we did, um, things started to happen that were really strange. And I started to get calls from like my mom, who was getting calls from other family members about me being in some softcore internet porno. <laughs> and uh, there, there was this it really ended up war weird moment where we were at my dad, my parents' house, and my dad started shouting from the basement, and I thought he was being attacked. So we ran down there and um, looked at the TV and the, this shower, the shower video, which we now call it, was playing on ET Canada. And it was so weird because this stupid video was playing on ET Canada, but then what was weirder is I, I looked over and I realized my dad hasn't seen this video yet of his daughter in the shower, as you, you know, and, and now it's on ET Canada. So it was like, the weirdness started there. So, I, I mean, first of all, it was easy to relate to, right? And so like everyone is you know, most likely a man or a woman. Um, and, and most people shower or bathe in some form. So people connected with it very quickly. And what happened is the phone started to ring. And like television shows were calling. And uh, online portals that we'd never heard of were calling. It was on the front page of YouTube and MySpace and Dig, which we'd never heard of. Um, because I didn't have a home computer at this point. We just made a video. Um, and so uh, and then MySpace called. And at this point, it was sort of on the way to accumulating about 20 million views. And MySpace flew me from my little job in Michigan to Los Angeles to talk about this like vague development deal. And in my head, I remember we were talking about this last night. I remember really clearly answering that phone call and picturing like six guys sitting in a, like an LA garage running MySpace when, in fact, it was owned by Fox, which I didn't realize until I got there. So I went <laughs> and I met Tom, um, who works in Tom a little office. And he has a photo of himself on his desk, um, which is strange. <laughs> and, um, and so we talked about this deal. And then we signed with uh, a talent agent in Beverly Hills, one of the big agents. And we were going to be this next big internet thing, we thought. And we're like, fuck, this is awesome. <laughs> like, this is so cool. So I went back to, um, to Michigan with a, a bag full of MySpace t-shirts and this really interesting story to tell my boss when I gave him my two weeks notice. And so what we did was we did the sensible thing. We quit our well-paying jobs and decided to be um, unqualified, unpaid internet content producers. <laughs> and so from there, we began kind of diving right into it and exploring. Oh, so you can't hear that. You need to hear that. How do we fix this? I can make the farting sound if that helps. <laughs> Great moment. I've seen it enough times. I have this weird like magnetic field thing where I, when I go near computers, they just kind of go and everything breaks. So that it, this might be the cause of that. I'm not going to blame Drew for that. It's probably me. So I'll just try to step away. I have these moments in, my, in our office, in our studio, when stuff just starts crashing. And, and the other designers and uh, video makers in our studio just say, Leah, just go for a walk. Like, just walk around the block. Get out of here. Everything's melting. There we go. Did I 
That one's called How to Conceal a Fart. People, people really like that. So, so we explored things like farts, because we thought that was really funny, and it might tap into the same audience. Um, and we explored things like nudity. And we realized quickly that farting was pretty funny, and being naked was a little bit funnier sometimes. <laughs> but farting while naked was like really, really, really funny. So this became kind of the basis of, of our journey forward. And, uh, <laughs> And so we explored, like, <laughs> we had this, I ordered this six-foot inflatable penis prop online, and we actually did um, a pretty comprehensive series of videos using, using this as a prop. So. so what was most surprisingly about all of this? Oh, this is a good one, actually. We talked, or someone was talking yesterday about um, attention spans. I think it was Chris Brogan was talking about attention spans. This is a perfect example of us figuring out who our audience was and what their attention span was like. Oh my God, I love this video. Hilarious. Oh my God, LOL. Kate, okay, moving on. You know, like, they're like gone. <laughs> but what was so um, surprising about this was that people were actually watching this stuff that we were putting out. So we were able to um, gather a lot of relevant feedback from our audience that really helped us grow as artists. Miha, you'd like this one, hey? You would be really happy when you saw this. You got this comment, Don't yeah. be jealous. <laughs> and we welcomed all of, this, uh, all of this feedback. Actually, Jay, um, we'd get a bad comment and Jay would be thrown into this downward spiral of depression and self-doubt. <laughs> 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 <until we, laughs> Until a little later where, you know, we had a couple more thousand views on the video and we, you know, we were checking all the time and refresh, refresh to see and then, you know, his spirits would be lifted up again. Um, so while all this was happening and we were waiting for our big MySpace deal to come through, um, which, you know, was taking a really long time because MySpace had never really um, tried to hire a content creator before and actually pay them to do content. So it took, it took decades to, to happen. So in the meantime, Jay and I decided to do the sensible thing and go backpacking in Europe since we had now quit our jobs and had no money. So at this point in time, we had um, about 13,000 friends on, face, on MySpace. Um, so when we decided to go to Europe, we asked them all if we could stay over at their houses. And we did this by sending out a bulletin on MySpace, um, asking them all if we could sleep over at their houses. And we got a lot of emails back. So three days later, literally, we were curling up um, on the floor of Duncan McDonald's tiny flat in London, uh, sleeping three feet from his bed between that, <laughs> that talking Yoda doll and a, a stack of anime DVDs. Um, and we had this really weird moment, where that moment there that just flashed by, where Duncan said to us, I was going to wear my J-Video t-shirt. And J-Video was kind of the brand that we were kind of using at the time for all these silly videos. The, and reason, he, the reason why we had that brand was right before I quit my job, my boss was going, OK, well, MySpace, cool. And he was going through all of my MySpace friends, and they were all 15-year-old girls. And so <laughs> I felt like it was an important brand decision to make it not J-Grandin, but J-Video, so that it didn't look like I was a predator. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's, and then the t-shirts followed. So we had these t-shirts. Jay and I didn't, didn't even have t-shirts of our own, but um, this guy, Duncan, in London took this t-shirt out and showed it to us. And we had this really weird moment where we were like, oh my God, we're actually reaching these people. Like there are people that are connecting to what we're putting out on, a, a, at a human level, on a meaningful level, um, that we hadn't really realized before because we were a little bit sort of blinded by all these numbers and view counts and, and uh, stuff like that. So because everything went so great with Duncan and we hit it off, we decided to carry on with this, um, with this sleeping with MySpace thing that we were doing. So we stayed with 
uh, Peter in Austria who, um, you know, let us sleep on his bed and he went and slept on the couch. We stayed with Elise in um, Grenoble who took us driving in the French Alps. Um, and one of the last people that we stayed with was a guy called Michi, who was also Austrian. We never even met him. He just found a way to get us the key to his apartment in an envelope through another friend while he was in Croatia with his family on holiday. So we realized that there was just this, like the, this trust that they were showing us blew us away completely. And, um, and we just, we engaged in this kind of weird social experiment. And so I, I guess that was the first time we made the connection between these people or these numbers online. And I, this is really abstract for us. Like, you know, I just bought a computer. And so, like, this was weird. Like, I was, I was very familiar with, like, with Hotmail. Hotmail made a lot of sense to me. I'd used MSN Messenger. But then all these numbers out there that were watching these videos weren't really people to me yet. And, and so when we were out there, you know, meeting these people, we were like, holy shit. <laughs> like, sometimes friends are actually friends, or they can be friends. And so um, that, that really changed the way we were looking at engaging with our audience. And we did this sort of internal math where we said, OK, so if 5% of these people that watch this stuff actually have bought into us somehow to the point where they'd let us stay with us or like buy a t-shirt or make comments or send us emails, then they probably care more about us than about this stuff, maybe. And so if we start making stuff that really matters to us, then that should be a really like step in the right direction with this audience. And, uh, and so we thought, OK, fuck viral. And, and we've been, you know, over six months trying really hard to recreate the success of this shower video which is something that just happened by accident. And you know, we'd borrowed a bunch of content from viral emails going around and, and smashed it into a video, and it did really well. And, uh, and we were getting really frustrated with not being able to recreate that by farting at like, the MySpace page. And, and so you know, it kind of it started to look like, oh, we're, yeah, so I, there's nothing actually on here. <laughs> but you know, our content started to look like this. We started to make stuff that really mattered to us. And what we noticed was that our, uh, our viewership took an absolute nosedive. And so it went from like fart jokes like, yeah, fart jokes, lots of people watching them, to like us making stop motion animations about like bunnies and stuff. And people are like, what? Not that it's any less ridiculous. But. Right, not that it's any less ridiculous, but what happened was that you know, the people that were really following and engaging with us started to engage a lot more. And, and they saw, I guess they saw us making stuff that we cared about and, and started to engage in a different level. And so, you know, we had this funny part where you know viewership went down and then engagement went up, and it became this really really cool experience. And so we're taking you know we're looking at people like Zay Frank, who he had a similar story to us where he did this just this made this online thing that went viral, and then he channeled that into the show into the zayfrank.org. Do you guys you guys are familiar with Zay Frank, right? Yeah. yeah. And so he created this really awesome community based on artists sharing with artists, and as a support network that came out of this just viral stuff and. And we thought, OK, well, we're just you know, we're creating maybe funny noise, but it's sort of noise, and there's no sustainable impact we can have with these people unless we change our tune. So, so what, I guess what happened what was what was motivating us. We, we looked at this comment maybe once and thought, OK, what is motivating us? And what, what that was completely changed. We didn't care anymore about view counts. We didn't care anymore about what our agent wanted us to pitch to him. Um, we just really wanted to start making videos that we would enjoy, and we hoped that that, that small 5% of that audience um, would also enjoy. So at that point, we kind of were, you know, we kind of pulled like a Jerry Maguire where we walked up into this room and said, you know, like, who's coming with us? You know, we're going to go do this completely different thing. And a small group of those people decided to, uh, to carry on. And so when we sat down with that glass of wine with Dania in Vancouver, and she said, you know, we realized Daniel's got this really incredible story um, with these youth. And since our audience had been whittled down to people that we felt really cared about what we were doing, we thought we have, we have the audience to tell this story to. So um, from that moment, we, uh, we started Urban Project, which is a small charity that, that we put together with Dania. Um, put up a PayPal widget, had some local um, fundraisers in Vancouver, and we managed to reach $8,000, which which seems like a really small amount, and, and it is, but in Tanzania it went a long way. So with that $8,000 we were able to help this group of street, talented musicians, street kids, 
um, record a hip hop, a six track hip hop album. Um, we housed 20 of them in housing for one year, uh, paid for some school fees for those of them that wanted to go to school, and um, paid them salaries for, a six, for the six week uh, project to sort of be hired as musicians. And, uh, and, bought, and, and hooked them up with some mosquito nets, which I, which I think a lot of them were more excited about than the album because having malaria every two months like really, really sucks. So they were super excited about those mosquito nets. And um, a little bit of context around these youth. There were 20 guys that we worked with. Um, they sleep outside. They wash cars for um, 50 cents a pop. And um, this music that they, that they make when they're not washing cars is... is they freestyle with each other. It's to pass the time. It's to keep them distracted. It's to keep them inspired. And um, they're talk this music is called Bongo Flava. It's a it's an East African style of hip hop. And one of the best descriptions I've heard of it is that it's like Western hip hop that's been taken apart and put back together with African hands. So they really own it. And these for these guys especially um, that are living on the street, it's, it's it's an identity for them. This this music. So. Um, in that music, they talk a lot about their life, about poverty, about, what it, about street boy life, um, AIDS, love, ambition. So their, stories are, their life stories are really embedded in these lyrics, which drew us to this project um, more than anything else. So while we're there, I went pretty slow through some of these slides. So these are the guys um, in actually in the house, the living room of the house that we rented for them on our, uh, our housewarming party, I guess. Um, which is pretty cool. So um, while we were there, you know, as we made this, I guess, somewhat gradual shift into trying to make content um, and to push content into the space that really mattered to us, we created this really, really great audience. And, and you know, as we were developing this project, there were a lot of people online that you know, gave us 10 bucks towards the charity or sent us like, a check for $15 so that we could buy tapes. So that was like, you know, that gave us you know, three tapes, which was great because we needed like 100 tapes. So, the money really added up. And we put about $18,000 of our own money into this project for the filmmaking side of it. And so we were really touched by that. And we, tr like, we made a huge effort to keep in touch with our audience and to nourish that audience while we were there. And so we'd go, you know, every second day, we'd break into the Five Star Hotel and steal their wireless. And we maintained three we blogs. We actually breaking into the well, It sounded cool, though. <laughs> um, so we walked in the front door because we had, to, like, we had a nice pair of clothes. And, yeah. yeah. And so we maintained three blogs. And Dania Fass, who we'd gone with, um, was an anthropologist. And she wrote uh, four urban projects uh, on the left there, um, uh, sort of from the perspective of, as an anthropologist. And she was really candid about you know, what we were doing well and what we weren't doing well as these three like, young, naive white people that just like, stormed into Africa with $8,000 to spend. Um, and then I wrote uh, a blog that sort of was addressed to the people that came from the J video crowd and continue to follow us on, on my website. Um, and Leah wrote from the perspective of a filmmaker on uh, Bongo, which is the sort of the working title of our film um, on that site. And you know, we, we were really careful to curate our photos really well and to blast out the most beautiful, rich content we could, considering the access we had uh, to the internet and, and all so that, that stuff. That corner photo where you see Stephen Harper, that's our prime minister. Do you know, didn't know that? that, <laughs> that if you didn't know that, the reason that's on there is uh, one of these Masela, Masela is Swahili for Hustler, one of the Masela sent me an email with, uh, with a verse, so he just randomly sends me sort of hip-hop verses every once in a while, and this last one that he sent me had a line in it that was sort of addressing uh, Stephen Harper in there, so he did a bit of research, obviously, and <laughs> found out who that, that's why he's there. You don't need to talk about Stephen Harper anymore, he's boring. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> what we were trying to do uh, with this project was um, help these guys create an album so that they had some, some kind of artifact, some, something that they could generate um, some sustainable uh, income from. So, selling the album on the street, selling the CDs, taking it to radio stations, promoting it, and um, trying to keep that going. But what we realized was that w what we were helping them make was a social object. And if we looked at it that way, then what we could do from here um, was take that social object and, and sort of continue what we had started and, and try to pass that around and, and amplify their story but still have it be their, their music, their story, their talent um, that's really uh, doing that. So Bongo is uh, the name of our film that we're making now and, and the, the film tells this entire story of what these guys did. So, yeah, and I guess the realization for us and you know, in some ways, 
I guess it feels like an insight at this point, but it wasn't along the way, is that we started with this audience of a lot. And we were very, very lucky to have this audience of 20 million. And at some point, we realized, OK, well, you know, like from Chris Brogan's talk, like be one of us. We weren't one of them because we were trying to give them stuff that we thought they wanted to see, like all the fart jokes. And I, I do fart. Like, I, I won't lie there. Like, I am, you know, I'm, I've got that part of the biology in my body. But that's not really our kind of humor. And, and you know, we wanted to start making stuff that really mattered to us. And so um, the importance of our audience shifted from this, this big amount and got whittled down to this content that we really wanted to, to be a part of. And then it ended up in this room with these 20 guys, um, which was really a really amazing experience. And when we were there, we realized that, you know, now we have the tools and like we're in this room with, I don't know, 200 of you or 100 of you. And so now these guys, their audience has just grown from two to 200. And through your social networks, I mean, that's got the potential to get back up to that, that 2 million mark or 20 million mark in this really interesting arc of sort of, you know, meaningless but quirky to something that's very meaningful and has an opportunity to create a huge impact for, for a group of dudes. So yeah, we went through this uh, really steep learning curve. Thank you. Um, you know, which unfortunately left this trail of trial and error that we'll never be able to erase. But we learned a lot through that period and, and learned a lot about what it meant to, um, to have an audience that you could talk to and that would listen. And um, so I'm going to find this meeting. trailer for you so you can get a sense of, uh, of where we're at with the project. The, uh, that's the film that we're trying to make. And um, at the very end there, that was Ninja. He was holding the album in his hands. We, uh, we left the guys with 50 um, CDs before we left so that they could you know, do whatever they wished with them. And um, we just got our own CDs that just came the other day. So You can um, buy them. <laughs> you can buy them. <laughs> this is just happening. It's, it's really exciting for us because we feel this incredible responsibility to tell these, this guy's story, these guys' story. Um, and... You know, when we look at the when we look at these CDs in the in the box, they don't. It doesn't really feel like al a box full of albums. Each one sort of represents their story to us in this little plastic case, and and um, and and also represents sort of denominations of ten of ten dollars each, which <laughs> which uh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> um, which is pretty amazing because you know. 
200 of those 10 house these guys in, in the house that they're living in now for another year. So it's pretty important to us to, uh, to try to uh, make something good happen for them. So that's what we're doing. So if you guys are interested in this, that was a little snippet of the music in that uh, trailer. We've got a box of these CDs. They're selling for 10 bucks, and all of that money goes to them. Um, and so part of uh, the charity's mandate is we want to support them for as long as we can. Um, and so the money from these CDs is going to go to their housing for next year. Uh, if we raise a surplus, maybe we'll go back and try to do another project with them or with another, another group in their social network. Um, and so you can buy these from us or you can buy them online um, if you want. And what's really exciting is that we, like, we need to sell about 2,000 songs to house them for another whole year. And so like, there are 200 of us here and if that gets blasted out through Twitter, I mean, 2,000 songs by the end of the day is probably pretty reasonable. So everybody um, go to www.dot. So everyone... <laughs> So, dbaby.com uh, slash give me five awesome ah. cool yay thank you that's awesome thank you so much so that's one guy for six months because of that sale so that's really cool that's it that's us that's what we did um, that was our story so if there's time for some questions I don't know yeah yeah, okay, there's any questions? Wait for that. Oh. I'm sorry, maybe I missed it somewhere in your guys' presentation, but how did, you, how did you guys make the connection from, to them? Like, how did you pick them as your project? Uh, Daniel was the connection to them. So our friend Daniel Fass, who we, who we met up with in, in Vancouver, Jay is an old friend of hers. They sat down for a glass of wine she didn't know anything about what he had been doing with video or what we had been doing with video. Um, and I think she just, she just said, do you know anyone that would want to you know, help make this yeah. happen and make a film about it? And Jay was like, me and called me on my cell and said, yeah. do you want to go to Tanzania in yeah. five months? <laughs> and I said, yeah, let's and do it. What she was doing was she was there doing her, uh, her masters and, and she met this group of guys and she was looking at uh, health and wellness as it relates to urban geography and place. And she really noticed this street corner culture uh, was present just because there's such high unemployment and these guys would just hang out and sing to one another as a way of, of um, having something to do, feeling engaged, um, being artistic and creative and it was kind of what get, got them through just the kind of the shitty part of their lives which is living on the street and, uh, and really wanted to go back and, and give back to them because she would, didn't have the opportunity to while she was doing her research. One more question? Nothing? Everybody's hungry. Do you guys want to hear another song <laughs> as you exit? Uh, you talked about some of the, or alluded to some of the struggles that you had, sort of as the, the three white people coming in and, and working with these guys. Could you, could you talk about that a little bit? Um, we, it was very weird for us to be these um, three kind of blonde, Dan is also blonde, um, very fair like we are, uh, Canadians hanging out with, you know, street hustlers. And, um, but she had made this incredible, built up this incredible trust with them already that when we walked into that, their world, we were accepted immediately. So that part of it was, was really easy. Um, filming in Tanzania was probably the hardest thing that we encountered um, because you're not allowed to film anywhere. <laughs> and you can't film anywhere near um, a post office or an embassy or a government building or a bank. And these guys, um, what they're, it's what's called their Mascani, which is basically their street corner where they wash cars and hang out. Their Mascani was literally surrounded by embassies <laughs> and one big bank. So we had to be really um, kind of incognito filming when we were in their at their Mascani, but we took a lot of trips out to the beaches where we did, you know, freestyle and we shot music videos with them and we did a lot of fun stuff out on the beaches where we could have a bit more freedom and so, um, Jay almost got arrested for wearing camouflage shorts one day because that's illegal there. Yeah. That was pretty scary. Big machine gun. On Luckily, Daniel speaks Swahili and, and uh, so yeah. she, she got us out of that with a very small fine. But <laughs> the, other, the other part of it, um, what was I going to say? Oh, it, we sort of, we walked in and we created this really artificial situation too that we realized while we were there and, um, you know, part of what we wrote about was like, 
you know, we thought we were doing a really, really cool thing, and we realized that you know, some of the, what we were doing was a little bit disruptive. And we, we came in, and we are like, OK, well, we're going to house you for a year when you've been sleeping outside for 16 years. And we're going to you know, pay you a salary when you've never had one. And we're going to feed you for six weeks. And we're going to help you create an album. And it was kind of like if someone came to Vancouver and bought us a loft in Gastown and set it up with like a bunch of you know, IMAX. IMAX or whatever. It was just like we had every, they had we everything all of a sudden. We wouldn't be able to handle that either. We'd be like, oh my god. You know, and, and we only had enough money <laughs> for 20 months. guys. So we had to, you know, the guys had to choose amongst themselves who was kind of in this project. And that really was kind of tough. And, and what we realized while we were there is that the, the social fabric on the street was very different in the studio. And, you know, on the street it was all about street smarts and, and life skills. And we moved into the studio, the, um, the power shift really went towards talent. And it, uh, it had a big, big impact on the social fabric of the whole group. And, and that started to translate back onto the streets and created a lot of conflict. And you'll notice in the, uh, in the trailer there, there was a bit of fighting. And those were sort of our two main characters that arose. One was the leader on the streets, and one was the most talented guy in the studio. And what happened is that they kind of went like this over the course of six weeks, which ended up in a like, fight with broken bottles and stuff. And it, it got really kind of wild. But then, you know. At the end, everyone was pretty happy. Thank you. That's I thank you. Thank you.